Explore the history, relationships, expertise, and data that go into ensuring Stein growers get maximum yield potential. This is the Stein Seedcast. Here's your host, David Thompson. Hello, and welcome to the Stein Seedcast. I'm your host, David Thompson, National Marketing and Sales Director for Stein Seed Company. We've got another great episode lined up with special guests, expert insights, and discussion on everything you need to know about maximizing yield potential. Our guest on today's show is Stein's Director of Agronomy, Todd Schomburg. I've known Todd for over 20 years now, and like many at Stein, he's held a lot of different roles in our organization. But as I said, today he's our Director of Agronomy. Todd's going to discuss how our team of agronomists are dedicated to help our customers make the most of every acre they plant. Welcome, Todd. Thank you, David. So, Todd, uh, you've been with the organization for, like I said, 20 years now. Um, and probably to give a little bit of context, I always like to ask uh, for a little bit of background. Tell us uh, really kind of about your path to Stein. Actually, I was uh, in uh, retail with New Co-op up at Duncombe. And uh, they had taken on the uh, Stein brand and Doug Brower, a district sales manager at that point in time, was the person that uh, worked with me and got to know him and got to know Bob Movahill, a name from the past yep. that was a region manager. Come to find out that uh, Paul Bissinger was considering reducing the amount of area. He, he was actually doing two jobs at the same time, and there was going to be a territory open up. And so uh, once we decided to move to Des Moines, uh, it was a great opportunity to start working with Stein Seed as, a, as an ISR at that time and um, back in uh, June of 2001. So, yeah, a little, just, just over 20 years ago. So, and refresh my memory, you're a Originally Northwest Iowa? North Central, actually. Okay. I grew up in, in Hampton, Iowa. There you go. I grew up on a farm, went to Iowa State, and got my degree there. Um, my goal really was always going to be farming, and I went back for five years and uh, enjoyed the uh, mid-'80s and the, the struggles <laughs> with it and decided there's uh, other things out there and uh, started working in the, the ag retail side and move through that process and and uh, got the opportunity with Stein. So you you dropped a couple of names there in, in the interim. You know, you get Bob Mulvihill and uh, Paul Bissinger. So those of us who've been around a while recognize those names. Great folks. Uh, kind of a big shadow in in the uh, history of the organization. But as you were you know already working in the egg segment and maybe talking to Paul or Bob, uh, I guess I'm curious. What were the things that you know, maybe led you to really explore the opportunity with Stein? What I really liked is, uh, you know, the process that everything went through. The sales rep, Doug, that I worked with when he called on us, did a great job. Uh, the products were great. It just, there was a lot of good agronomic information that was being provided at that point in time. And it really was kind of exciting knowing that it's kind of your own business and as an independent sales rep that, uh, you know, the harder you work, the more you can make. And it just was uh, something I thought was going to be enjoyable to get into and be a part of. And it's uh, obviously has been. And talking about Paul, so, you know, he was one of the one kind of person who helped train you and history lesson. Paul was really the very first salesperson we ever had in the organization uh, going back to 1979. So uh, just curious in those early days, I mean, it's got to be like uh, learning from the sage <laughs> of sorts. Uh, what, what was that like coming up through with, with Paul? It was really interesting. Um, he had a lot of wisdom. He knows Everybody, there wasn't a stranger that he didn't uh, didn't know, and he just did a great job, you know, helping with getting to know the people in the territory I was in. Uh, like I said, he was really doing kind of two roles at that point in time, so he he was really busy. But we spent a lot of time together, making sure that we were making the right recommendations, and uh, he did a great job of introducing me to the growers in the area as well as the the retailers. And so, yeah, so that was like 2001, you started, and as you said, you were an independent sales rep. Uh, so you had a number of accounts. What was your area? It was kind of just central Iowa, north central Iowa? It was six counties, okay. um, included Dallas County, um, went 
uh, it was pretty much on the west side of I-35. Okay. Um, was a, the the tier of counties in there? And again, you'd you'd been in ag retail, you'd been in the farming side, so you've been around agriculture. So that wasn't you know necessarily new to you. But I'm curious in those earliest days, are the things you reflect on? You say you know that was maybe different than I expected. You know, it's it seemed you know working with the growers and working with the retailers, it was uh, you know you always had to earn your own. And so the respect that, that Paul had from all those people, I had to earn for myself. And, you know, it's, it gets to be a little bit of an uphill battle sometimes. Um, but I think with the, the time and, and the effort put into it, you know, I think it was definitely, it was worthwhile and, and I enjoyed it a lot. In those days, you know, early 2000s, again, how did you define, you know, Stein for those customers, those dealers and or growers that you worked with? A lot of it was, you know, it's a, a family-owned business. You know, the genetics are well known, and you know, just making sure and helping them place the products the way we needed to, the corn and soybeans, and making sure the best our ability that they were planting them the way we needed to have them planted. And you talk about placements. That's you know interesting because that's going to lead into you know your your future <laughs> role with Stein. But in between there, after a few years as an ISR, then you took on a regional leadership role with the organization, right? Yes, I did. In Iowa, uh, right? Kind of the It was actually Iowa and Nebraska. Okay. And about how many years did you do that? I uh, was an RM about 5 years before the the program changed to a RSA. Yeah, and, and we had an internal change there where we went kind of from what we called a regional manager to a regional sales agronomist. Both were regional leads, but uh, slightly different role and responsibility. And and the territory reduced quite a bit. It pretty much changed. went to northwest Iowa, was down to basically 25% of the state versus two states. The other thing that occurs to me, so you currently are, well, you're CCA. Correct. And uh, and you uh, serve on the state board here in Iowa, is that correct? That's right. Uh, how long have you been a CCA? Uh, I've been a CCA over 25 years. Okay. And I guess for the uninitiated, CCA is Certified Crop Advisor. Yeah, Certified Crop <laughs> Advisor. It's it's a, a rigorous test. Uh, you have a national test, and then you have a state test. And then every year uh, you have to have CEUs, which are credits, and it really kind of forces you to learn more. I, I really enjoy it. It's a great, great organization, and it just raises the the value of what we're bringing to the to the grower. I don't know if you remember several many many years ago when we had a big push to get a lot of our folks CCA certified. Do you remember that? Yes. And uh, I, had, I I took the test. Um, I did pass the national. Did not pass the state. So I'm half of an agronomist, which <laughs> is pretty much worth nothing, just so you know. Um, but uh, I have a lot of respect for, for people who, who are certified because it is a lot of work and it's a lot of knowledge. And um, so it, it, it's just a great accreditation, you know, for our team to have. So talking about, you know, here becoming director of agronomy – uh, when was that? Three three years? Yep, 2019. Yeah, so 2019, the company made a decision we wanted to provide an even greater uh, resource in agronomic service. And so we tapped into Todd to become director of agronomy. So tell us a little bit about that decision and that process. Uh, I went into the office one day and sat down with Myron, and, and he kind of gave me his vision of what he wanted to do with the agronomy department and uh, asked if I would like to run that program for him. And it was, you know, really exciting to see that. I enjoyed what I was doing as an RSA, uh, loved the, the ISRs that I worked with and, and felt like we all, you know, we had a great team. I really hated to make that change, but to me it was an opportunity to do something different and still, I can still work with those ISRs. It may be in a different capacity. There's more of them to work with now, <laughs> but uh, it's it's uh, basically taking the same concept and and you know looking at over the whole company versus just one region. Yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, one of the nice things I think that that's a common thread that runs through a lot of these interviews that we do, and, and you're you're the same, is uh, people who've again held a lot of different. 
um, roles within the organization. Uh, even among your team, you have folks who have had e- either past experiences in ISR or as a uh, maybe in a regional uh, leadership role. And so there's a lot of tie to uh, the sales organization. Uh, so in addition to the agronomic expertise they bring, they also have a pretty deep understanding of us as a company, right? Yes. Oh, definitely. With uh, Tony and Bill, they they knew the the ins and outs ahead of time. That makes it a lot easier for me, not having to teach that and and to understand that. Bringing Tom in this last year, uh, that was my first person that came in from the outside world. And so, you know, we just wanted to make sure that he understood the processes, what our ISRs are doing, and how it's different than the rest of the world. You know, other seed companies do it a lot differently. Yeah, and that's a great point because, you know, agronomy, of course, applies to a lot of different things in our industry, but I think ours is a little different take in the sense that whether it's uh, soybean genetics, corn genetics, a lot of things we do are um, our own, right? And so uh, the knowledge base is is, is pretty in-depth here, but the things don't necessarily apply everywhere, right? Because they're our own genetics. Yeah, so. definitely. We're a genetics company and we're selling those genetics to the growers and making sure that hopefully we're doing our best ability to get in place to our ability to be um, for maximum production for the grower. So describe for me a little bit what you consider to be kind of the mission, uh, so to speak, of the agronomy department in this day and age for Stein. Um, it's really customer service. I look at customer service maybe a little differently than, than some, even though our RSAs or employees and our independent sales reps work for Stein as independents. To me, I look at those as our customers. We need to really help those folks through the the training process and getting to know our products better because my opinion is is if if we can bring them to a higher level of knowledge that's going to be good for them and the more they sell, the more money they can make and and it it ties them closer to to the Stein brand. Yeah, so sort of the discipling concept, give them the information and then they can go out and and share that with the world. Yes, definitely. So what are some of the projects that your team is working on now, you know, different different aspects of what the agronomy team does? Because I know, as you said, they're here to support our sales team in a lot of different ways. But just in a broad overview, what are some of the things that your team gets involved with on a regular basis? Probably the biggest project was the, the plot program. I thought that was uh, something that we really needed to help the uh, ISRs are out in the field. It's just another tool in the toolbox for them to be able to to help in the sales process. That's one of the projects, and that's ongoing. That doesn't end um, by any means. We're always trying to make it better and, and updating it. One of the things new this year that we did, uh, we did an emergent study, and basically uh, we took four days and took four different color flags and as the first plants came out of the ground, we, we put the first color flag in. And then basically from there on, coming back three days in 24-hour increments and putting the next three colors in, we're going to carry that out to harvest just to see what are the ears look like? What are we, what are we really seeing? How does uh, uh, emergence affect yield as well as the ears? And is it different with different products, different companies. So it's it, that one's been a fun, fun project. Another project that we're working on is adding weather stations throughout the country. Uh, most of the time it's with our master yield in the field plots. We're trying to, uh, one of the main things that we're using with the weather stations is obviously we're looking at rainfall. But the other thing that I've always wanted to really have data and good information, more localized data, was growing degree days. And with the, with the weather station and the software that we're using uh, with, with the plots or the field that's around it, we'll actually be able to type the planting date and the harvest date, and we'll be able to come up with the actual growing degree days. Oh, fantastic. And I think, you know, in an upcoming episode, we're going to talk to a couple of your team members about that very study, what we call the flag study or the emergence study. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about, you know, the methodology on that because I think it's really interesting. Yep. Um, The other thing that we did uh, this year, we did a treatment study. 
And so we took our uh, MX Hybrid base treatment and just randomly added different products to it. Um, we added more insecticide to one. We added a fungicide to another. We added uh, micronutrients uh, to another, all on the same base, um, a biostimulant, and then took all of the six and put them together. And, you know, we're just trying to look at, see if what we, how it changes the emergence, how it changes how the ears look, and obviously the, the final piece of information will be the yield. And what's neat about these projects is, you know, with the team you have now in place, you have enough horsepower to do this kind of uh, study the right way, right? You, you know, these aren't one-off things that you're doing, oh, we did one over here and we did one over here. But I love the fact that the methodology is such that, okay, these that can be replicated and these can be, you know, sort of consolidated for purposes of really getting pretty good data out of that because that's the goal. I mean, it's these aren't just for demonstration purposes. These are actually for collecting real data that we use to drive decision-making uh, and hopefully help customers make better decisions, right? Oh, definitely. I mean, we try to um, get them tied to or close to our master yield in the field plots, which is our training plots that we utilize. And having those there, it gives the opportunity for the, the ISR and the RSA as, as well as a grower to, to look at it throughout the season if they'd like. And, and you mentioned master yield in the field plots. Um, if you would talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a great topic and a great thing that our, our agronomy team helps us with every year. And it's a great resource for growers to learn more information. So what we do as agronomy team, we uh, ask the RSAs have a minimum of two per region. And it's our core products that we're selling are a part of that. And then we add experimentals to that of what we're looking at for down the road in the future. And then we have competitors that we add to the plot. So uh, we want to make sure that they're planted correctly. We um, make sure they're planted by height as well as try to get as wide a number of rows uh, possible. The goal is to have 12 rows wide. And then we harvest the middle six, just making sure we don't have uh, any issues with, you know, the height of the corn next to it. Um, throughout the season, uh, we do a lot of things. We take emergent scores. The RSAs uh, will do ear, top leaf, and tassel heights. We like to do uh, harvestable ears just to make sure that through the season, we've kept those plants out there that we, that we thought were there and that the ears are all harvestable and can get in the combine and, and add to the overall bushels. And then obviously we, we take that data, put it all together and uh, pull out reports and information for the company and, and for, the, for the ISRs to use on sales calls, you know, if they need that tool in that toolbox. Well, and what I like about it is I know you guys have set up protocols. So here again, these are uh, fairly well replicated. The sets of products you look at are replicated so you can, you know, look at this data across multiple different environments. And uh, even from, you know, if I remember right, I believe you you even have them planted uh, ideally in height order, right? Trying Definitely. to take out yeah. take out the, the shading effect that we see sometimes. And so, again, just highly replicated information, which I think is really valuable. And also this is a tie back to, you know, our elite data, in a number of ways, right? So the elite data has been what's driven our corn program for years and years. And now you have this mastery in the field, which which is uh, working with those same products, but maybe on a broader scale in a more, I don't want to call it real world environment, but it kind of takes it out of the research side and into the field side and see if we can sort of triangulate that data, right? Right. And, and a lot of the things that the elite trials were doing, I tried to mirror within the elite, our, our master yield in the field plots. So we were getting the same information. Like you say, it could be different row width and, and whatnot, but at least we're going to be doing the same thing and we can make a good comparison. I mean, you know, we're getting close to silking and pollination time, and those are two dates that we work really, really hard to get from our hybrids just to see the difference of especially our, our products that we're selling today versus some new products that we're coming, coming with forward. You're talking about, you know, pollination time, you know, which is kind of going on as, as we're recording this episode. And I know that's something that you guys do a lot of work on notes as far as silking and pollination. 
And that's something here again, probably going back to the fact that we deal with unique genetics, right? So uh, we need to do our own homework and figure out what it is we're working with. Um, and silk and pollination are about as important as it get, right? Oh, that's that's it's what it's all about. Yeah, because without the right timing and the right, you know, you're just not going to going to get no the job. kernels, no ears. No, no horn, no yield, no yield. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, talking about you know infield uh, situations. So, I guess you, you know I know that in any given year, there's a million things going on. You know, agronomically, right? Um, I'm just curious right now, from your seat, overseeing kind of the U.S. as a whole, a corn growing area. Are there are there certain topics that are driving conversations right now? Or are there certain topics that are commanding more attention than others these days? Right. Um, I would say probably just because the timing, uh, a lot of fungicide questions, you know, should we be spraying fungicide? Should we not? Um, You know, what's your opinion on that? Um, We had some storms come through the state, you know, last night. And um, I think, you know, people are wondering, you know, if we have hail damage, what should you do after that? Should you, you know, do be doing a fungicide? Should you not? It seems to be a, a hot topic right now. And fungicide, unfortunately, is one of those things that you may only assess the true value after you realize you wished you had it. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, so it's hard to say whether it was right or wrong unless you unless you missed it and then you realize it was needed or or whatever. And I know here again, this time of year, that that's what starts to happen. You start to see a lot of storms, a lot of wind events, things like that that can cause problems. And while we're talking about that, you know, several times on, on, the, on the podcast, we've talked about the fact that our corn genetics are unique in their stature and their architecture, whether it's high density corn, high population, or, you know, as it's starting to be talked about in the industry as shorter stature corn. So... Uh, you know, we've been talking about that for a decade. Uh, as your team is out talking to growers, is are there changes around that conversation with regard to short corn? Yeah, I mean, people are starting to understand, you know, why we went down that path and why are, why we're recommending or why the short stature corn is uh, becoming more and more of a hot topic, especially when there's other people starting to talk about it. Yep. And that makes it really interesting. Um, I've had heard of quite a few calls, even from the, the most recent storm, that were once again, um, the, the tall hybrids were down and our shorter stature hybrids were standing way better than the other, other products that were out in the fields. So it really uh, comes to light of how important that really is, especially when you have that kind of uh, weather happening. Yeah, and, and like you indicated, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long, long time, and I guess to me there's a certain sense of pride in in knowing that, hey, we've been here talking about this for a long time, and, and um, certainly other folks coming around to the idea helps uh, lend further credibility to the idea, but I'm glad that we've been pushing that conversation forward and that growers are really starting to understand that, I think. Oh, definitely. I think they, they understand, you know, how we're working with it, how they can make it work within their own operation, um, and, you know, trying to get some of those rows narrowed up a little bit to, to push more plants in there to, to push the yields even higher, especially with the, with the way the corn markets are and grain markets, I should say. It's exactly. More so than ever, every, every bushel counts, right? Big time. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, short stature corn, uh, fungicide application. What other things? What, what do you hear? What's on growers' minds? Just because of uh, that time of year again and the weather patterns, you know, we're seeing more on the soybean side. We're seeing um, a few of the calls on cup beans and, and wondering what's going on with, with the Enlist E3 beans. And, of course, the national deadline for spring dicamp has passed, so... Uh, we would expect to start to see some of those things emerge right after that, right? Definitely. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're going to push it right up to the end, I'm sure. Um, but hopefully with the rain that we've received, and it, it seems like it's in a fairly widespread area, uh, maybe not out east as much, um, hopefully that's going to knock some of that um, product down from you know floating around out there. And so it's maybe will be a less impact this year than what we've maybe seen in the past. 
So, you know, we're kind of headed at this point deep into the dog days of summer. And uh, we know that grain is being made, right? Uh, so what do you counsel growers? What's their plan of action now for the next, you know, 60 days, 90 days? I mean, what do they need to be doing? You know, they're, you know, look at your crop, see where it's at, see if there's any issues, um, be out there scouting uh, for insects, um, uh, Japanese beetles have been an issue in the past and, and they like to clip the silks. And so, you know, there's always that chance. I mean, silks keep growing until they're pollinated, but if there's enough of the Japanese beetles out there, um, there's not enough silk coming out of the chute that you can actually, uh, get it to pollinate, which once again, you, it may be some blanks, you know, on the ear here and there, but reducing those, kernels on that ear is, once again, and reduce the overall yield. And is that something that, you know, they can, if they're out scouting for it, I mean, they can determine how to attack that in a timely fashion? I mean, Oh, definitely. Okay. And it's just being out in the field and, you know, paying attention to what's going on, looking for diseases, you know, looking for different type of insects. Now is a good time. Rootworm, you can evaluate, you know, if you're using a, a Duracade corn, or you may need a duracade corn, you know, through rootworms, you know, if you have some plants that are leaning for some reason. To me, just, you know, being out in the field, scouting, uh, looking at the crop is really the best thing that the grower can do at this point in time. Are the things that growers can take note of now and that may require action later on? I'm thinking of soil sampling, you know, post-harvest and some of those things. I mean, how do they determine, because you're right, you're kind of in this year now, right? And how do you set yourself up for the next year for maximum success? Um, you know, you can look at if you have some deficiencies of the plant, the corn and soybean plant is showing any kind of deficiency. Either you mark the area to go back to and get some localized soil sampling, um, or, you know, just make sure that you keep your soil samples up to date because you want to keep your fertility levels there because the healthy plant is always better and it's uh, less likely to get a disease, it's less likely to have stress, excessive stress to reduce yield. So you want to make sure those uh, P and K levels are up to where they need to be. So soil sampling, fertility, all of those things help put the puzzle together for a successful growing season. And there's a lot of a lot of cover crops this year. Um, evaluate, you know, how well the cover crop did for you in your field as you're, as you're scouting. Um, I walked quite a few fields this year that had cover crops, and there's times that the crop struggled coming through it, but there's other times that they didn't. And uh, there's so many different things to do with the cover crop side of it. Just make sure it fits into your you know, your plan and, and what your goal is in your overall production. So what's, uh, what's future plans for your department, for the future of the agronomy department here, Stein? I know we've placed a big emphasis. That's an area we see as being critically important for supporting our customers' needs. But, I mean, I guess specifically what are your thoughts and ideas? We have two levels of agronomists that, that are on my team. Corn technical agronomist right now, um, that team is full. There's four of them across uh, the U.S. That, that work with me. And, you know, their ultimate goal is, is working with corn and making sure that as we're placing it and working with it and making it a priority to take that information to the grower. And then we have a field agronomist positions. We have one right now that we just had. Uh, uh, he's been with us for about a year now. And how I look at that role is it's, it's closer to the, to the dirt. It's closer to the ISR and RSA because of the geography. They're better able to work with them on a daily basis, um, working with plots, getting in wor and doing things with, with the plots. Our people are really busy with a lot of things that are going on, and it's easy to miss uh, silking and pollination dates. It's easy to miss different things um, to do. Uh, throughout the season, if you're looking at, at diseases or whatever, it just gives us the opportunity to, to send that field agronomist out and work with the ISRs and RSAs to make sure the data is collected and it's, and it's consistent. 
So just more eyes on the task. Exactly. <laughs> and and that role is going to be growing. Uh, I just hired a gentleman um, that's going to be covering Nebraska and Kansas as a field agronomist. And right now I'm also looking at um, hiring one in Illinois. So we're, we're really going to try to focus hard on the corn areas um, that we have a great opportunity to grow that business. And uh, so the growers um, that aren't planting Stein corn uh, can be and, and understand um, our products. So plans are continue to grow the program, continue to find ways to add value for those customers to help them understand Stein genetics and place them for maximum benefit. Definitely. Customer service. We want to be there right away. We want to we want to exceed the expectation of the grower and be there in a timely manner. And it, what's nice is with the team, it can be any of us. If one of the corn technic agronomists can't get there, um, we'll, we'll send a field agronomist. Or if one, if there isn't an issue in another part of the, of the world or, you know, the U.S., if there isn't problems in other areas and it's localized, we'll bring those corn agronomists in and make sure we'll take care of the area that where there are issues to make sure the customers are taken care of. For those tuned in, we've been visiting with Stein's Director of Agronomy, Todd Schomburg, about our talented agronomy department and the agronomy services that we make available for our grower customers. Todd, thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. That's our time for today. I want to thank our guests and our listeners for joining us for another episode of the Stein Seedcast. We'll be back again soon with more expert interviews and insights about all things Stein. And to never miss an episode, subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. Subscribe to the Stein Seedcast wherever podcasts are found. To learn more about Stein and its elite corn and soybean genetics, visit steinseed.com. Stein has yield.